Welcome back to the RightWave Audio community. My name is John and for this video we are going to look at schemes for color coding XLR balance cable. And the reason why we're doing this is for a couple reasons. If we look around now our system we're seeing that more and more equipment is coming enabled with XLR balance connections as an option. And there's a lot more of them more connections, right? We have surround sound systems, immersive systems with Atmos, Oral 3D, DTSX, that not just have a base lay layer with seven or nine channels, but they could also have height channels with two, four, six, or more on the heights, plus subwoofer counts are going up and up from one, two, four, and more. How are we going to keep track of all of this? How are we going to label it? And RightWave Audio for our own theater has a unique need right now because we are going to be setting up our surround sound amplifiers away from our preamp some distance on the other side of the room. So we're going to be wiring our height channels to equipment, to, to uh, amplifiers in the rear of the room, then sending the preamp signal that the preamp signal is going to be coming from the front of the room so we want that noise to be down so we really want to use balance connections because we're going long distance so how are we going to go about color coding labeling these things in a clear way in a clay in a way that's going to be sustainable a long long period of time because i've used stickers of you know p touch personal uh, label makers and you put these on it look good for a while but then they come unstuck and they you find them on the floor and what good is at that point and I think even if you're running in an equipment rack all your equipment locally there's a lot on the back of these processors on these receivers I just pulling up here one example the Marantz AV8805 manual and you can see all the the balance connections that it, it, it enables and being if you had them trace these out if you didn't have anything labeled you'd have to trace that wire all the way down to the amplifier even if it was below it 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 gets cluttered back there so i think it's really important to have good clear labeling now ripe wave audio uh, we like to look to standards first let's see if there's a standard out there for color coding our cables and and see if we can follow that now we did come across one but only one uh, that's out there as an official international standard and this was the ANSI CTA CEDIA uh, standard 863B now I just downloaded this from the the website and it's a free download which is nice uh, you, you have to put in your email address and all that, but you can download this at no cost. And one thing I noticed, uh, although this was published, it looked like it was uploaded in 2018, it's really a 2011 standard. And when you get into the details of this, they only go up to 12.2. And you can remember in 2011, Immersive Audio was not established uh, firmly. Uh, I think Oral 3D was doing some work. Uh, the others really hadn't um, uh, hit the street so 12.2 was the thing so this is li limited right off the bat we know we're not covering all the immersive channels but they do establish colors and distinct colors not just for the position the room front rear surround etc and they do have some height uh, like the front height is addressed but they use even different colors for left and right uh, to show that. So you, you really got to memorize this table as you're looking at it uh, to, to really even understand left from right, right? Was, was my left channel blue or gray? And, and you really have to have that reference handy in, in, in your head. Uh, they make all subwoofers purple and light purple. So subwoofer one is purple. And subwoofer two is light purple. Uh, they don't really go beyond two subwoofers. So this is the uh, CDS standard. Uh, 
this didn't seem perfect for me because I want to be able to go beyond what's what this is covering. Uh, they even get into details about you know, Panatone colors so you can match the colors exactly. I did read in the in the standard they did address if not all of the inputs or output channels are addressed. Uh, you can refer to this other table, this table three in the document, but it reuses the same colors from the standard. So I'm confused of how I would apply that because they it, it really just seems like if you're just going to number and not, not align to particular channel uh, locations, left, right, center, uh, you could use these colors with, with a number after them. I, I, I don't see how that really helps me expand beyond what the standard is. They're not introducing really a lot of new colors. I don't sure they're introducing anything more than light blue here. Uh, so what I did was then turn to uh, some of the equipment manufacturers and, and Marantz, you know, they do a good job with their manuals and they do suggest color coding for one of their later processors. And this is the 8805 again. Now, this is the A version. Uh, one thing I noticed is, yes, they do get pretty close to the Cedia standard on the front channels, but then they start to deviate. And then I'm looking at the, uh, the immersive height um, ceiling channels, and they're just reusing light yellow and yellow over and over and over again. How is that helping me uh, to differentiate between my front wides and my height channels and my top front, top middle, and top rear channels? How does that really help? And they're making all subwoofers black, uh, even though this unit has distinct outputs on uh, subwoofer one and two. So I'm not happy with really either one of these suggested color coding. It at least it is a, a standard. Let's take a look at these two standards combined and see how they line up first, though. And and you can see the deviation here when this combined table. Uh, and, and it's really interesting to note that Marantz has reversed a couple of these and made some changes. So, for example, on the surrounds, where CD was using blue for the left channel, Marantz uses that for the right channel. And for the left channel, it's light blue versus the right is gray. So light blue and gray are close, but it's not the same. And then they flipped as well the surround rear, the brown and the tan or brown and the beige. Beige and tan are about the same anyways. They flipped the left and the right channels. Uh, so these don't line up. Uh, clearly, uh, it makes it easier to see in one table, but it really drives home the fact that they're not the same. So we set that aside for a second and we said, well, we got to get some connectors. Maybe some of the connectors have options for color coding because you you see these even on RCA cables. The, they might be red uh, for the right and, and, and white or black for the left. And that's pretty common over decades now. So can I get some XLR cables? Uh, connectors with some color coding. I went to Neutrik uh, pretty quickly. This is pretty much an established standard. Now, some of you might have preferences for other brands, uh, but I feel Neutrik is is a good, solid brand and and well established. So, I wanted to see what they had to offer, and, and they I'm homed in on two of their most popular series: their X series and their XX series for three pole uh, XLR balance. You know, there's, they make ones with more connectors in it, but uh, I'm focusing on the, the three pole ones. And uh, it seems like the XX series is the more um, newer one. It has enhancements over the XX, the, the original X series, which was, you know, is kind of an industry standard. But the, the X, uh, X series had a, a lot more options today. You can get some that have more RF immunity and and some that are higher end and some are right angle, et cetera. Some will let you do some crimping versus soldering on, on the connection. And uh, yeah, and they even support wider, uh, bigger diameter cables. Like if you get the, the uh, 
the XX14 series, it will take you from the standard uh, outer diameter support of 3.5 to 8 millimeters and then extend that to 8 to 10 millimeters on uh, the XX14. So uh, if you if you want to use it for those applications, because we're using in-wall cable, the diameter is awfully uh, thin. So we'll probably use the standard on this. That's what I selected. Looking into their catalog further, I find they have these accessories and they got color codings for this. So as you take these connectors and you, you get them from Neutrik, you know, they come apart and they've got these rings that you can take on and off. Now, when you get a, a Neutrik connector, here's a standard one. So I'll take it out of the envelope here. And you've got the, um, the pins. This happens to be a male version. You've got this um, clamp thing that really grabs that cable. Uh, and I find this works well with the small diameter cables as well. This is your bushing. And um, this is, and on this bushing is also, and it's black. This is the default color cover color so when you buy this it will come black on the bushing black on the ring and that's all in there together but optionally you can get a different color ring and a different color bushing that will go together to make this now when you put the cable together if you're smart sometimes I'm not you put your bushing on the cable first because once you solder the ends on can't take the bushing off. So you've got to make your color choices uh, when you make the cable. But on the ring, you could swap this out after you solder. So the rings can swap out later. So that is how the modular they are. And if you look at their catalog, they have the same color choices uh, for both the X and the XX series. All the style is a little different, uh, but you, you have a lot of variety on these uh, between the bushing. So when you get these, it has a different color uh, bushing. Here's a yellow one versus the black one. And you can get the different color rings. And here's an example of a red ring versus the black that comes standard with it. So they have this table here. Uh, go on their website. You can download this. It gives you all the uh, ordering codes. So if you order black, uh, if you want black, you order it as the zero, the dash, uh, put the zero extension on this, etc. And so there's 10 color choices for the bushing and for the ring. And uh, this gives us a lot of options. So you can mix and match and uh, what you want to do. And if you still run out of colors or you want to do something special, they do have what they call a translucent or a clear bushing. And I'll have to find one here. I found it. So these, the clear ones, so you can get a label maker or, or handwrite a label and, and slip this on. So if you run out of your color coatings, you've got this. I like this. Um, I may, may use this route uh, in the future uh, if my expansion, if I expand beyond what I currently have. So you can see that the XX series again has more options. I think that's the only series that allows for the translucent clear um, ring on that. So because the Cedia and the Marantz standards and other standards from other manufacturers don't align with what I want to do, we created a RipeWave audio standard. Now, you could adopt this, or you could modify it uh, for your own liking, or you could go back to the, the CD, whatever you feel comfortable with, but this is just another option of going about it. So what did we do? We decided that we would use the ring to indicate uh, uh, left, center, and right, or black for uh, a subwoofer channel, um, or black for when when there is no direction required. So you could, if you did have a subwoofer, 
You might have left and right and center subwoofers, which you could use white, green, and red, or if it's not directional at all, make it black. And that's the standard that we did for the ring. So we end up with, you know, different ones here. So if I'm using the white here, this, this knows uh, we're going to be doing, that's going to be a left channel. If we use the red, that's going to be a right channel and and so forth if i use if i use black um, that could be non-directional so black is the default when you order these connectors uh, the bushing and the ring are black by default then you add these these are a few pennies but it does add up if because you got to get left you got to get both ends of the cable c connected uh, so i spent it about two hundred dollars worth of uh, materials here to to accomplish what i have planned for my next phase but then I can use all these different colors for the bushing to indicate the placement of the room or the type of uh, device it is so I'm using the default black for the fronts I'm using blue for the surrounds I'm using brown for the surround rear which those three those blue and the the brown kind of line up with the other standards to some degree I'm using gray for the front wides. So gray and black are similar. So you have black in the front and gray surround wides. I'm using yellow for top front or top height. I'm using white for top middle. I'm using orange for top height, top or height rear. I'm using violet or purple for the subwoofers. And for my inputs, I'm using green. So for my Parasound uh, Z Phono uh, preamp, which I'm going to mount at the back of the room with the turntable, that is going to be green. So I'm keeping the turntable now away from my main front speakers. And I have a lot more room at the back of the room to, uh, for, for that setup. Again, the long distances that we're going to be using. So I'm going to put all this together and we'll come back and we'll do a conclusion here. At this point, I have taken all those parts that we got in and I've assembled them with the color coding that of the RipeWave audio color coding scheme that we wanted to use. And we put this together. Now, in the process, I've learned that a few of the rings and bushings and connectors haven't come in. So it was a partial order that we received. But we got enough here together to show you how the concept all comes together. And so when you look at this, you can see that everything on this side has a ring on it that's red for the right side of the room. And everything on this side has a ring on it, which is white for the left side of the room, except for two. We have the subwoofers, which have a black ring denoting that this is a non-directional channel. As far as the bushing colors, this is denoted with black up front. Those are your front speakers, left, right, and center. This one needs to be green, by the way. This is a center channel. This, uh, the green rings did not come in, so that, that will eventually have a green ring around it for the center channel. Then we have the uh, gray ones here, which are the front wides. Actually, don't have those speakers yet, but I figured I'd get that all made up. Uh, we have the uh, side speakers, which are blue. We have the rear surrounds, which are brown. And then we have our ceiling or height channels. We have the front top, which is yellow, and the rear top, which is orange. The last set is at the back of the room. That's for our phonograph. That's for the phono preamp that we all ultimately, the, the Z phono preamp will run XLR back to the processor at the front of the room. And so this is how it all comes together. Of course, there's, there's counterpart uh, XLRs for the processor or amplifier connections as required. And uh, yeah, this, I'm happy with this, this um, system. And what we did on a couple of these is we used the clear translucent uh, uh, rings on here. And what I did is I using an Excel spreadsheet, 
uh, typed out the text that I wanted on the label, and it, it could only be so long. But uh, And then I still get the left and the right color because I colored the cell in Excel as either red or white for left or right. I could have used green for center channel if I wanted to. And uh, so I can keep that going even with these text-based labels. I print it out on just plain uh, paper, used a paper cutter to, to trim it up. And uh, just sleep. these are pretty loose, these uh, clear rings. So you, it has enough space in between there to put the, the label. I didn't actually have to use any adhesive, uh, just held it in place until I screw it all together. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's not too bad. I, in fact, I kind of like those. So I'm trading, I'm trying to think whether I want to go with just the colored rings or ones that I can put text behind. Uh, certainly the text would give me that, that full option. Although the, the, just the plain colors are much more simplistic. So that wraps this up. So what do you think? Do you like uh, the scheme here? Would you go with one of the established standards, a manufacturer's standard based on your processor and what they're recommending for colors in their manual, if they do that? Would you adopt the RipeWave audio uh, scheme here? Would you take that and modify it or come up with something on your, no your own? That feedback would be useful to the RipeWave audio community, as well as whether you like the, the rings being um, translucent with the your custom label behind it or just the plain colors and would you do the channels on the bushing or on the ring as I would I have done it again that feedbacks very useful to this community let me know how you're doing this how would you put this together as a labeling scheme and you could apply this as well to unbalance we just happen to be showing balance because that's our current application if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and hit the bell icon so you'll be notified when the next video is posted. Until then, keep evolving your audio experience.